Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to, uh, to see you. Uh, hello, is my colleague, Joe. We are twins with our dark blazers and, uh, and, and great beards. Uh, but it's great to have everyone uh, here today. Um, my apologies, but there's a roaring in the background here, so I will try to speak a little louder. That, that inevitably starts the moment you're, uh, you're going to start a webinar, a podcast, or a Zoom, so my apologies. Uh, but it's great to have everyone uh, here, and I'm going to turn it to my colleague, uh, Joe McAndrew, who leads everything to do with transportation and mobility for the partnership in a moment here. But by way of uh, introduction, just wanted to make a couple of quick comments about the topic that we're going to explore uh, today uh, and uh, why the partnership is engaged in this work and uh, in, in our view as to uh, how it fits and what it means for the for the region. First, and this is a pretty obvious point, but transportation uh, really represents an essential ingredient for the region to reach its full inclusive growth uh, potential. Um, we started the work with our blueprint for regional mobility in 2018 that laid out a pretty com uh, comprehensive strategic path for the region to better connect the capital from region from Baltimore to Richmond uh, to improve the experience of transportation. And I think as important, uh, ensure equitable access for all residents. Um, uh, there's a big emphasis on innovation and integration in that work. Uh, and a key solution that emerged in the blueprint was the modernization of our regional inner city rail network. Uh, the region has a very robust rail network. It's really advantaged uh, in, in having that foundational infrastructure and it provide, which provides tens of thousands of trips each day, uh, at least in non-pandemic uh, times and soon again in this year. Um, it's expansive and it's extensive, but in many ways it's an untapped resource. And uh, the work that we're gonna talk about today is really designed to help take the next steps uh, to tap that resource. Mark, VRE and Amtrak service is fragmented, which makes rail travel more complicated, more time consuming, and less able to meet the region's travel patterns, particularly for certain populations that are generally underserved anyhow. That limits our uh, productivity uh, and it creates a real opportunity cost. Um, it also creates a competitive disadvantage for the region, where with such a great underlying asset, we really have an opportunity to have a tremendous uh, competitive advantage uh, for this region. Um, the other good news, though, is that recent efforts in Maryland, in the district, in Virginia show a strong willingness across jurisdictions and sectors to transform our rail network. Um, the collaboration that's led to this work, but also the collaboration that we've been, uh, been fortunate to participate with around our transportation work generally is also a real asset and a real marker for a differentiator for the region. The real vision that Joe's gonna present uh, takes these plans and investments and it's a it aims to create a shared vision and action plan to maximize the independent investments, uh, those in things like Mark, VRE and Amtrak, et cetera, and realize a truly transformed and integrated regional rail network. It's a bold vision, it's a big vision. It's uh, what we seek to try to catalyze uh, as solutions at scale to some of the really critical opportunities for the region here at the partnership. Uh, and we built this with strong commitments from our board of directors, uh, as well as with regional leaders such as Delegate Jared Solomon that you'll hear from shortly and, and many others, all of, the, all of our panelists whom Joe will introduce to you. Um, we wanna thank them all for, for their efforts and participation, um, but also a broad range of business and other advocacy groups throughout the region. This work literally cannot happen without everyone joining arms to uh, ensure that we come up both with the best as well as the most actionable uh, plans, and we've been delighted to uh, be able to participate in that. Each of these leaders, uh, including our board, are committed to this vision. We're confident that we can realize a transformed regional rail network as we unite behind this shared plan and approach. So thank you all for attending. Um, and uh, my apologies for yelling, but uh, I think we managed to, to, to speak louder than the noise outside. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, our head of uh, all of our transportation and mobility efforts, uh, Joe McAndrew. Joe? Thank you, JB. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for joining us here today. I hope everybody is doing well. Uh, and we uh, look forward to today's conversation. I'm gonna flip up a deck real quick and just give a quick high level overview of what the uh, regional rail vision is, uh, and then we will get into a discussion with our panelists. Um, 
why do we need a, a capital region rail vision? Um, that's a great question. Uh, what we've got in this region that JB hit on is uh, a, a system that is far more expansive and robust than many of our peers throughout the country and many folks would be envious of. Yet it is not uh, performing at its optimal uh, potential. Uh, it, is a, it is a sleeping giant, shall we say, that um, could be better leveraged to better connect people to jobs, opportunity, uh, and help the uh, region uh, be more competitive in the global marketplace. You know, our work, uh, the Capital Region Rail Vision builds on years of uh, bold, expansive plans, oftentimes uh, contained within one jurisdiction or one rail operation. But we're building off of uh, a vision of leaders that have come before us that have thought about greatly expanded, far more uh, robust, uh, fast, frequent, reliable, uh, service um, that are, are presented here uh, today. Why we think that the rail vision is badly needed at this time uh, hinges on a few key items that you can see here. You know, one, um, the time is ripe. Uh, there are many key barriers, physical infrastructure barriers, as well as political infrastructure or political barriers that have gotten in the way from us being able to uh, think about a truly regionally integrated uh, cohesive uh, rail system. You know, a few key projects here like the Long Bridge project uh, connecting the District of Columbia to Virginia and Point South. Uh, that is moving forward at a quick pace uh, in, in tandem with the transforming rail in Virginia agreement between Governor Northam, CSX and Amtrak that was announced in 2019. We've also got the Washington Union Station uh, project and the BNP tunnel project that is moving forward uh, at quick pace and we're excited that, you know, we believe that the president-elect uh, Biden's administration is going to be a key partner in many of these infrastructure projects, uh, as well as our federal delegation pushing for their completion. So we need to think bigger about what each of these projects mean together, uh, because uh, there's a great opportunity. At the same time, uh, our region is getting more closely connected. The demands of our commuter flows, as well as demands of our travel patterns, go beyond one jurisdiction. And we need to be thinking about how to connect across jurisdictional borders uh, to, to jobs and opportunities and, and enable people to efficiently and quickly get home at the end of the evening uh, to be with their families uh, in, a, in, a, in an appropriate time frame. We also need to provide equitable access for people to act, uh, get to our, our region's rich uh, cultural uh, job opportunities and educational opportunities that currently are not afforded due to our, our fragmented rail system. Uh, and I will continue to say this, we've got political momentum. We've got, we're building off of plans that are uh, in their own right uh, bold, uh, but they're held within jurisdictional boundaries. So we're trying to knit those together with the capital region and rail vision. So what is the rail vision? The rail vision uh, was released in Dece December uh, with uh, our panelists here, as well as other key regional uh, stakeholders that are helping us push this effort forward. It, it focuses on three key goals that we think that are un, underpin uh, transportation writ large, but also uh, this effort. We wanna make sure that uh, the vision, if, if uh, uh, fully executed, it's gonna enhance our regional economic competitiveness and collaboration. It's gonna ensure inclusive growth, uh, providing benefit to those that uh, have historically not received the same level of investment, but also making sure that uh, the growth uh, it doesn't displace folks as well in terms of housing affordability and the like. And then finally, we need to expand uh, access to moderate and affordable housing throughout the region. We've got uh, a lot of housing opportunity, but it's disconnected uh, from our transportation uh, system, specifically our, our rail network. Um, the vision under, under that uh, has five key components uh, that we're gonna work to try to achieve uh, full execution on over the next 25 years. First and foremost, we need bi-directional run-through service. This means that we've got trains going both directions uh, at all times of the day. Right now, uh, on all of our commuter rail lines other than the Penn line, uh, we've got one directional flows into the District of Columbia in the morning and then out in the evening, uh, limiting uh, those train seat or those train uh, trip connectivity and creating a, a major uh, bottleneck at Washington Union Station. 
We want to provide a, a seamless rider experience with a unified uh, fare policy uh, and, and rail brand uh, that is coherent, easy to understand, and easy to navigate. Uh, this, this work is not going to be fully achieved without an increased level of service across all of the lines. That means all day service from morning to late evening. Uh, we would like to see 15 minutes or more frequent period weekday service, including uh, greatly expanded express stop and then new night and weekend service as well, so that it is more than just a commuter rail line, but actually a rapid rail transit connection. We need to look at uh, integrating or better coordinating our various rail operations. We uh, in the capital region from Baltimore to Richmond have many uh, invested stakeholders and elected leaders and transportation leaders. Uh, we need to work better to uh, create a shared vision and then a shared, a shared game plan to execute. And that's what the vision here is, is expected to try to achieve. And then finally, we need to have a, a more robust, consistent, predictable capital investment program uh, on some of our key infrastructure projects, but others as well, to make sure that we're able to achieve this program. Uh, we are uh, working with a, a group of experts that I'll list here in a few that have helped us build the assumptions uh, that underpin a lot of this work and, and the findings here on the next few slides uh, spell out kind of what those benefits would look like uh, for individuals, say going from Baltimore Penn Station to Washington Union Station, you'd see a, a market increase, a 206% increase in the number of trips on that line for Mark on a given day. Uh, and you'd also see the time cut uh, down uh, markedly on the vision uh, for, for express train service uh, and believe that we can get lower depending on the uh, efforts that, that our elected leaders and, and transportation leaders look to achieve. You know, new transit options from Baltimore Penn Station to Alexandria that didn't exist before will be existing uh, if this rail vision is executed upon. Again, we'll see uh, threefold increase in, in trips uh, during the peak period and we'll see faster train travel between those points, making it more competitive for the travel. Uh, from Odenton to La Enfant, um, we would see uh, opportunities again, 200% uh, increase uh, and markedly faster uh, train travel. Uh, and then New Carrollton to Crystal City, two uh, very quickly emerging economic hubs in both Maryland and Virginia uh, connected with 30 minute train travel and, and far more frequent train travel as well. Um, as we envisioned it, uh, the vision would be uh, executed over four phases. The first phase starts uh, last year into this year and it's the launch phase. Uh, a lot of this phase is getting plans and investments in place so that we can expand the system. We cannot expand the system with the current capacity on the rail lines. So what we would expect to see over this time period uh, is uh, Crystal City and Alexandria station improvements are completed and Alexandria to Longbridge additional trackage is complete. Uh, in the next phase uh, is the expand phase. This is when a lot of the transforming rail in Virginia program is, is developed and executed. So we'd see a full four track corridor in Northern Virginia complete. Longbridge will be complete and completion of a four track from Longfont to Virginia interlockings and, and platform improvements at Longfont station, really building out its capacity and potential. Uh, for the District of Columbia. Uh, the next phase is when we really start to see expansion of service uh, unfold, and that's the realized phase. This is when a lot of the big bottlenecks come off the, off, off the plate here. Washington Union Station expansion will be complete. The BNP tunnel will be complete. We'll start to see that market expansion on the uh, Baltimore, Baltimore to DC pen line, uh, the Amtrak Northeast corridor. That is really locked up right now with the BNP tunnel and without uh, alleviating that two track corridor uh, bottleneck. We're not gonna be able to see market in, uh, improvement with, with mark service on the corridor. We're gonna go ahead and start to see that operational integration and coordination come to bear between mark and VRE, uh, where we're looking at compatible fleets, ticketing and the like, as well as brands. And then finally, uh, transform. This is when we truly, truly see the full benefits over the 25 year period. Uh, of uh, you know, the full vision of 15 minute headways, bi-directional travel uh, between all of our stations 
uh, providing one seat seamless efficient connections for folks to be able to get from home to work or other cultural assets that we have with that, with, throughout the region. Um, this work cannot be complete uh, by one entity or one individual or one group. Uh, it takes the collective uh, from Baltimore to Richmond coming together, identifying uh, the vision and then staying committed to it. We've been lucky uh, since this project launched in, in July of last summer to have uh, the support of the advisory committee members here on this slide uh, working with us um, to help uh, drive the vision and, and ultimately help us execute the approach. Uh, we've also been uh, lucky and fortunate to have uh, key technical committee members uh, making sure that uh, what we're proposing is, is within uh, their work uh, stream as well. And, and like I said, all of this work has been supported by a, a great team of experts at Ernst & Young, Gensler, WSP, and VHP as well. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to the panel here in a second, but um, key elements that we're still working on on the rail vision include a technical report and a build out of the benefits across economic productivity, uh, inclusive growth, and making sure that everybody can benefit and targeting those benefits to key populations and then also making sure that we can improve access to affordable and moderate housing. Uh, that product we expect will be released before Q1 2021 is complete. And then we're working with partners uh, throughout the capital region to move it into, into practice, uh, including further enhanced coordination between MARC, BRE, DDOT, uh, Amtrak, BRE, and the like, uh, as well as keeping key projects moving forward and, and uh, legislative efforts like Delegate Solomon's Mark Pilot run-through bill effort from 2020 uh, moving into the General Assembly. There's a lot of opportunity and we're trying to knit it all together. Uh, so uh, with uh, that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, in a second introduce our panel. Uh, we are lucky uh, today to have a group of experts uh, that invested their time and energy in the Capital Region Rail Vision and, and they've been at this effort for a long time and we're excited to, to have a discussion today. Um, uh, first, uh, the panel uh, includes uh, former chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, Sharon Belova. Sharon uh, was uh, first elected to the Fairfax County chair, chairman position in a special election in 2009, was reelected in 2015 and 2019, and retired recently. She is the founder uh, of the Virginia Railway Expe Express, BRE, and is the current uh, Virginia Passenger Rail authority, the newly created body's vice chair, helping steer the creation and, and the development and ultimately the forward pro progress and momentum in, in uh, Virginia. She's, she's also chaired in her time uh, uh, Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments Metro Strategy Group, understanding the key challenges and opportunities that this region has when we all work together, and was instrumental in helping bring Metro Silver Line to Fairfax County and uh, the Metro 2018 uh, funding deal that uh, was historic in nature. Uh, she's a Nord Northern Virginia resident since 1966, and she lives in Fairfax uh, with her husband. We're also lucky to have uh, the Honorable Danielle Glaros, Council Member for District 3 for Prince George's Council. Uh, Danielle was first elected to uh, her four-year term on the Prince George's Council in 2014 uh, and was re-elected in 2018. Uh, she was elected by our colleagues to serve as the council chair for the 2018 legislative year. And she is the current chair of the uh, council's planning, housing and economic development committee and the vice chair of the transportation infrastructure, energy and environment committee. Uh, Danielle served as the chair of the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments Region Forward Coalition. And she chairs the Prince George's County Housing Opportunity for All Work Group and is a member of the Purple Line Corridor Coalition's uh, Purple Line Steering Committee. Next, we've got Jay Corbalis, Vice President of Public Affairs for JBG Smith. Uh, in this role, he works with a wide range of stakeholders to create a long-term value by aligning the interest in transportation investments to their uh, efforts at National Landing. Uh, prior to joining JBG Smith, Jay was a part of the mixed-use development team at Federal Realty Investment Trust, where he worked on large development projects like the Pike and Rose Project. Jay has an under, undergraduate degree in urban and regional planning from Cornell University, a graduate degree in real estate development from Georgetown University. And he and his wife 
live in Silver Spring, Maryland, and he would enjoy taking the run through train from Silver Spring down to National Landing someday. Uh, next, we've got Audrey Johnson. Uh, she is the Director of Economic Development at Johns Hopkins University and Johns Hopkins Health System. In this role, she is responsible for economic diversification and innovation in the Johns Hopkins University and Johns Hopkins Health System footprint to incite emerging sectors, strengthen assets, support growth, and solve complex challenges. Prior to joining Johns Hopkins in 2020, Audrey led Kaiser Permanente's Mid-Atlantic States region's supplier diversity portfolio and economic impact strategy, driving economic opportunity for the District of Columbia, Maryland, and Virginia markets. Audrey was recently named president-elect of the National Association of Health Service Executives, Baltimore chapter. And in 2019, uh, she was selected as the Healthcare Champion of the Year and received the Community Leaders Award by women of Prince George's County. Audrey is an advisory board member of the District of Columbia's Anchor Partnership, and she has an undergraduate degree in economics from Howard University and a master's of business administration and finance from the George Washington University School of Business. Whew, we've got a great group here today, guys. I'm gonna go ahead and take down my screen um, and we're gonna go ahead and start the panel discussion. Hello. Hello. How are we doing? <laughs> um, I will go ahead and get started uh, with the first question, and, and uh, we're going to do this a bit of a, a round robin and open discussion. Um, you know, whether in your personal life or through your work, how do you engage or rely on the region's rail network today? And, and maybe uh, we'll start with uh, Chair Belova and then um, go around the horn. Thank you. And can you hear me okay? Great. Um, first of all, thank you for this opportunity. And, uh, and thank you for the work that you um, have been doing and will be doing uh, to, uh, to help make the vision a reality. It really starts with the vision, which as a way of introduction, that's what got me into government and into politics. It was um, my, actually my predecessor's interest and COG's interest in starting and establishing uh, passenger rail, VRE, on the existing uh, freight railroad tracks. So it started with a vision and, um, you know, and I was very pleased to then become elected uh, or get elected and, and then have the opportunity to help make that vision a reality. Perfect, thank you. Um, Council Member Glaros. Sure. Um, I think I'll start by just sharing one thing that wasn't in my bio, um, which is that I happen to represent District 3 in Prince George's County. Um, I oftentimes say that's ground zero for almost anything happening on transportation, but as it relates to this conversation today, uh, both, both the Mark Line and the Camden Line actually come through District 3. I myself live in the town of Riverdale Park, um, a five minute or less walk from the Riverdale Park Mark Station, which is on the Camden Line. Um, and so throughout my life, I've actually had the opportunity, I don't get to do it day to day um, anymore, um, not just because of the pandemic, but because my office is in Upper Marlboro. Um, but throughout my career, I've actually used the Mark Line, um, both actually to get up to Baltimore early on, uh, when I was working for the Governor's Office of Smart Growth and the Department of Planning up there, I would take the Mark Line when I was living in DC way back when, um, all the way up to Baltimore. Um, and then I oftentimes took it into DC when I was working in DC along my career path. So I, I just find that the commuter rail system is such an integral link um, as we connect ourselves in our communities um, and pretty important for the work that we're doing here in Prince George's County around New Carrollton Metro Station, College Park, Seabrook, Bowie State University. Perfect, thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to Audrey Johnson. Hi, thank you, Joe. Um, first, I wanted to say thank you for the opportunity, and I'm really excited to be a part of this work um, and be a part of today's conversation with them, my fellow panelists. Um, I will share that I don't ride the rail system very much. Um, I'm sort of the oddball here. Um, I, I drive around um, and, you know, Due to my work, I can be in Baltimore in the morning and DC or Virginia in the evening, of course, when before COVID. So, but I do frequent the train and travels up 
Northeast to Philadelphia or New York. Um, but I am looking forward to what a better rail system will do. Um, I think that it offers, at least for me personally, and definitely for our constituents at Johns Hopkins, opportunity to sort of ebb and flow and get around the region a lot easier. Definitely, thank you. Uh, and Jay? Thanks, Joe, and uh, thanks for having me here. And, and thanks for all the work that the partnership has been doing on this issue. It's been fantastic to have the, the leadership from the partnership to, to put all this in perspective and give us all us something to work towards. Um, as you all may know, JBG Smith uh, has some uh, activity in National Landing. We've got some uh, a lot of build out to, to do, and a lot of that is centered around transportation. In fact, um, in addition to my role at JBG, I'm, I serve as the co-chair of the National Landing Bids Transportation Committee, and we released a report last week called National Landing Mobility Next, which I'd encourage you all to check out. It's available on their website, nationallanding.org. But it talks about our vision for creating what will be America's most connected downtown, meaning there is no other, there will be no other place in the country where you can leave your office or your apartment and walk to a train, walk to the metro, walk to regional and local bus lines, have uh, bike share, uh, bike and trail facilities, and walk to a domestic or in international flight. There will be no place like it in the country and regional rail is an incredibly important part of that. And we say more about it in the report. So I encourage you to check that out. And then lastly, on a personal note, I happen to be a, a, a transit nerd from, from uh, my entire life. And in fact, uh, it's not just for today's session, but this is happens to be the decoration of my basement is the Philadelphia Regional Rail System uh, as proof of that lifelong uh, interest. So again, thanks for the opportunity. And Delegate Solomon's bill would encourage Mark to uh, close the only commuter rail gap on the Northeast corridor connecting SEPTA uh, to, to the MTA system and, and then, then to Point South. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and, and for everybody uh, on the horn today, uh, please, um, if you have questions, we will get to them later, but please add questions uh, to, to the chat bot or to the Q&A and, and we will get to that in the future. But as we go, we'll keep going and we'll come back and open it up in a few. Um, to the panel, uh, I think JB said this well, and, and you all know this intimately, we as a region are, are lucky and blessed to have the rail system that we have today. It's not yet hitting at the optimal level. And, and I, one of the slides that I showed, is the history of, of better rail service has gone back decades uh, and led by many of the partners, business organizations, advocates, and the like. Uh, progress has been slow. Um, and, and challenging. So, you know, from your vantage point, what are some of the key stumbling blocks that you've seen to making progress on a more frequent, fast, uh, reliable, and co coordinated uh, regional rail network? Um, maybe uh, Councilmember Glaros, start with you. Sure. Um, I think there's a few different things that we'll point out, but the one that comes to mind my, first and foremost is that we still consider ourselves as three distinct places, Maryland, D.C., and Virginia. And at the end of the day, none of us actually operate that way, right? Many of us work in different places than where we live. Um, many of us have friends that we visit in all of those different places. We are much more of a connected region. Um, and yet our transportation system doesn't really reflect that. And I think our, our structure of how we think about ourselves, um, we still have separate plans, right? There's a separate plan for Virginia's expansion, a separate plan for Maryland's expansion. Um, and yet at the end of the day, we are completely reliant on each other. Um, and because of this, I think we're just missing a lot of synergies. Um, so that would be like the first thing I'll throw out there, but there's a few others that I, I'm sure people will highlight as well. Definitely. Jay, you wanna go next? Well, I, I totally agree. Obviously the jurisdictional divide is a, is a foundational issue on, on this front, but I, I would, and not in the spirit of your question, Joe, but I, I would actually offer that you know, in the current moment with what Virginia is doing with their transforming rail and Virginia package, I think it's an incredibly exciting time on this issue, more so than any time in the past few decades in terms of the momentum, political and regulatory momentum behind what we're all talking about. Um, and just have been incredibly pleased through the work led by the partnership of the collaboration of the Maryland, Virginia, DC. Um, so even though it has been a historical stumbling block, I'm very optimistic and, um, you know, the efforts that Virginia is doing that deserve a ton of credit, but also the involvement of all the agencies and entities 
in what the work the partnership has done. So I, I think there is a lot of good news too. Perfect. Audrey, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, I'm going to take it. I totally agree with both um, comments before me, um, but I'm going to take it from a very different angle. Um, I think helping residents, local businesses, and other members of the community understand both what the direct and indirect um, benefits are um, and what resulting from a new coordinated rail system can be challenging. Um, you know, how will something like this improve their quality of life? How will it um, enhance their community? And then again, how will it still stimulate the economics, right? In, in all of these different um, areas. So I think there's work um, that we have to continue to do in that space. But in addition to that, um, I like us to kind of think about the old infrastructure as old branding and how to be, um, how to best present that in, a, in the new, more reliable and the convenience as benefits and not changing something that's familiar, old and no longer useful. I'll talk about the Baltimore tunnel, um, Potomac tunnel that you mentioned a little earlier. Um, it is a bottleneck, right? I think they call it the um, shortest distance crawl because when <laughs> trains go through that tunnel, they only can go at a certain, certain speed. Um, so it totally makes sense to be a part of this and it totally makes sense to be redeveloped. It's, you know, I'd say ancient. It's been around since the system was created. Um, but however, I think that, um, you know, we need to understand that the communities, you know, that that new, this new system will will disrupt the community. And so I think there are ways even in these first few phases to ensure that we're engaging them in equitable ways um, and placing as much focus on change and adjustments that the communities will experience throughout the process and then how they maintain and gain on the other side of it, I think is important. Definitely, definitely. And, and Chair Belova? So we are a region and, um, and we work together as a region but also that's where the complexities um, come in, where we are, you know, the District of Columbia and then two states, Maryland and Virginia. We have um, different um, forms of government. Uh, and when it comes to uh, things like rail, uh, like Metro, uh, the way we pay for, you know, for infrastructure is different. So stumbling blocks, that, that really is the difficulty, is bringing us all together. Um, questions like, you know, what would the governance look like for a uh, for run through service? What, what kind of governance would there need to be? Um, who pays and what's fair? You know, these are questions that need to be answered. And, uh, and so that's, you know, really part of the, you know, the, um, nuts and bolts of making making the vision happen not that it can't happen <laughs> and yeah. we've had examples you know and especially with uh, metro funding wamata funding um it looked impossible to bring the district and maryland and virginia all together uh to agree to a you know a um an agreement as to how money was going to be uh, raised and spent in order to improve the rail system. So it's, uh, I think, you know, the important thing is that we're specific in what we're trying to do. And, uh, and when we're able to, you know, be purposeful, things happen and things mm -hmm. have happened and they can happen again. I like it. I like it. Thank you. Um, you know, each of you, uh, graciously volunteered your time, your expertise, your talents um, to, to the development of the Capital Region Rail Vision that, that I highlighted. Um, you know, our intent was at a high level to chart a path forward to a greatly enhanced, reliable and competitive regional rail network that tries to tackle some of the friction points uh, that have gotten in the way from, from meaningful progress over the years. Um, maybe a quick around the horn, what, what excites each of you the most about the rail vision, whether it be a project, a policy, 
a, a conversation that you've had that, that inspires you to where we're heading. Uh, and maybe I'll, I'll start with uh, Audrey here. Sure. Um, well, you know, I'm in economic development. So <laughs> what's exciting me about this is the opportunity that it presents. Um, you know, in my work, I am interested in helping, you know, create more inclusive ecosystems. I know that um, Johns Hopkins has taken a few different steps. We have a few different programs that are committed to local um, Baltimore businesses. Um, you know, there's our Hopkins internal program that focuses on how do we increase opportunities, expand our purchasing, our construction projects. Um, there's Be Local, where there's a consortium of businesses and institutions. So there's really been um, this focus. Um, and I'll also add the Goldman Sachs 10,000 small business, where we've really invested on, you know, small business, local business capacity. So just thinking about all of the development that will happen over the next 25 years and how we're at essentially growing a pipeline of businesses that could you know, really participate and play in that development process is exciting to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, many folks will recognize the name. Uh, former USDOT Undersecretary uh, John Bercari, who's a friend of the partnership and a friend of many, has oftentimes said to us that um, Maryland already has their silver line. It's called the PIM line. Uh, we can triple ridership. We can see great economic potential. We just have to go ahead and prioritize it as a, as a key asset and start to invest in it. But I think along mm -hmm. those lines, you know, there's a lot of good stations there, New Carrollton, Odenton, that are prime uh, for, for opportunity is the question of, do we see it and can we realize it? But mm -hmm. um, next, maybe we'll go to Jay. What most excites you about the Rail Vision? Well, as you noted, Joe, aside from the ability to personally connect uh, more quickly between Silver Spring and National Landing, which is my real long game in all of this, um, I think what excites me the most is the opportunity to expand the uh, attraction to, to connect the region more closely and make uh, more opportunity available. But what I mean by that is we have a piece in the Rail Vision, I think, Joe, you've got a visual for us showing what the... Um, when you connect and run Maryland trains into Virginia, what that does for regional mobility, in particular for people looking to go to and from National Landing. So we looked at when you make that connection, how many more people that versus today are within a commuting distance of National Landing? Look at the orange there. It's about 765,000 people, smart, diverse, educated workers that, that really make this region so attractive to large employers. Um, are you know almost a million additional um, potential employees are available within commuting distance. That's incredible from a business standpoint. Um, on the flip side, if you're a new employee in National Landing, um, uh, through running means there are approximately an additional 100,000 moderately priced homes within the um, realm of the regions, uh, relative to the region, moderately priced homes that are now within commuting distance for you. So it's also a housing, it addresses housing as well. So the, to me, the, what it does to the rearranging the regional geography and putting more places effectively within reach is the most exciting. Definitely, definitely. Uh, Chair Belova. So we all have assets um, throughout the region and, um, and those assets are different in different places. Uh, what excites me about uh, being able to realize this vision uh, would be for us to be able to share our assets. Um, educational assets, affordable housing assets, uh, diverse housing, and um, you know, economic opportunity so that you know, we can sort of bring those pieces together. And um, you know, that, that really is, is what it means to, you know, to live in a region for us to be able to share in, uh, in the things that we're able to bring to the table. I'm originally from Baltimore, <laughs> so I love the idea, you know, <laughs> of being able, you know, to have a service that connects, you know, Maryland and Baltimore and Richmond and, uh, you know, throughout, throughout uh, Virginia. It's, you know, it's a, a very exciting opportunity. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, mobility is what makes us successful. And, uh, and this really would be transformational. Perfect, thank you. And Councilmember Glaros? 
Yeah, I mean, I think in many ways, I'd echo a lot of what my colleagues on the panel said. I think the one thing I would just go back to is it's doable. I mean, at the end of the day, this rail vision, um, particularly if you consider Delegate Solomon's bill, um, you know, it's doable. Um, Longbridge is in, you know, we're in the midst of making these major infrastructure investments that people have seen as impossibilities. Um, and so I, I think for me, what gets me excited about it is we really could start making this happen with some small tangible steps. And it already builds on the visions that both Maryland and Virginia and DC, frankly, have independently created. And all it does is actually enhance it and increase our ridership and our potential. Um, so to me, that's what makes me really excited. And then, and then from a Prince George's County perspective, you know, I think so often our county has been a little less connected with the region and yet it holds so much potential both for creating opportunity, for connecting our workforce for additional jobs. Um, and I, I just see the opportunities in our communities and neighborhoods along the alignment. Um, we have so many stations in Prince George's County. We actually have seven of them. Um, if I counted right <laughs> this morning, um, that are, are part of this. And um, each of them, I think, holds their own neighborhood potential um, for local community growth and then connectivity, which I think is also incredibly exciting. And then, yeah, I get really excited about this 30 minutes between New Carrollton and Crystal City. I mean, um, to me, that that is like, that tells you how accessible we really can be um, when today that commute is pretty much twice as long um, in most scenarios, non-pandemic, of course. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. We've got, uh, I'm gonna ask two more uh, questions here and then we'll get it uh, open to the Q&A. Um, Audrey and Jay, from a business perspective, you know, Jay, you might've hit on this already a little bit, but you know, why is the region's rail network a key element for, for Hopkins and JBG Smith's strategic development uh, plans? And maybe start with Audrey and then, and then go to Jay. Well, um, first I'll just say that with Hopkins being um, one of the largest employers with our university and health system, in Baltimore, but I think also one of the largest in the state. Um, it's important that that mobility and that connectivity that everyone just mentioned um, is important for us. We have employees, students, faculty members that navigate and move around within the region um, for different reasons. And right now it's just not um, easy given the, the existing rail. So the, the, the benefit and, and strategically for us um, is giving them the ability to kind of move around um, more quickly, take those quick trips um, by train and, and you know, those located in Baltimore getting into DC. We are, you know, one of our real estate development projects is the 555 Pennsylvania Avenue that's happening now. Um, there will be employees there, employees that live in Baltimore that will be traveling daily down there. They'll be, you know, and then I think vice versa, we have talent that live in Virginia and DC, employees and students. That, so I think, you know, giving them that quality of life where they can get around. Um, there's several folks that, you know, we work with that they have to get to NIH. They have to get to different federal agencies. Um, and these are just, you know, day trips and then make it back. So the rail system will support that. But then the other point I'll make, you know, Johns Hopkins, um, this rail system will make it more accessible for people around the region. Um, you know, our health system, our university, you know, there's lots of different things. And of course, you know, I have to shout out the Charm City. Baltimore has a lot to offer. So um, I imagine that, you know, with a rail system, people that normally don't, you know, go to Baltimore as an option because it's just not that easy to get to, will take advantage of that. Definitely, definitely. Jay? Yeah, and Joe, you're right that, um, you know, I hit on it earlier. I'll just say it again. It's the uh, attraction of, of employees, uh, the, the 
growth in how many employees you can attract as a large employer. And then for the employees, the expanded access to uh, housing options and just accessibility throughout the region. That is extremely valuable for businesses and uh, employees and potential employees, um, all of whom stand to benefit from better access. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, one, one more question. And for folks, if you have questions, please uh, add them to the, to the question and answer uh, tab, and we'll get to those in a second. But um, to, to Chair Belova and Councilmember Glaros, you both hit on this a little bit. Um, doing regional work is hard. Uh, but we've also, I think in recent years, it's incremental, but we're also seeing big wins, right? Longbridge Act passed Congress, not just because the entire Virginia delegation bipartisan supported it. You had council member, uh, or sorry, Representative Norton and you know Representative Brown, uh, um, Senator Van Hollen and the like supporting its passage as well. In 2018, we took a historic step forward on Metro uh, with providing a dedicated, dedicated funding. You know, from your perspectives, uh, has the regional elected leadership changed um, from these? Have we has our DNA, DNA changed? Our expectations and our willingness to work together, and if so, kind of how can we bottle that up and best use that to to move this big effort and forward over the next twenty five years? Maybe start with with Chair Belova. <laughs> I, I think that um, we've matured as, um, as a region and, you know, I've been a member of COG, Council of Governments for many, many, many years. Regionalism is hard, um, but, but it, uh, the payoffs are tremendous and we have so much more in common than we have differences. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that we have changed and I, I, I really saw funding for Metro uh, as pivotal. It, it really made a big difference. We, you know, we, we actually were successful and uh, with something that looked impossible. And, uh, and so I think that there's an appetite um, among elected officials and, um, and, you know, and experts within the, within the region, including Greater Washington Partnership uh, to, you know, to, you know, we, we were able to do that. There's more that we can accomplish uh, working together. So I think there's an appetite uh, that, that maybe hadn't been there some years ago, uh, but it took really, Metro was falling apart and, uh, you know, and something had to be done. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we were able to pull together and, uh, you know, and, and make that happen. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I would, um, I mean, I would say the same thing. I think that I remember when I first moved to the DC metro area, I also grew up near Baltimore, actually in Baltimore County. So several of us on this call have a strong love for um, Baltimore. Um, but I moved in the area back in early 2000, had moved back from being actually in the Midwest for a little bit. And I, I think where we are today in the conversation is just a very different place than, than where we were you know, 20 years ago when I, I moved back to the area. Um, and it strikes me that I think we have had some really strong wins. Um, and, and I'm always reminded, you know, of, of, the, of the saying, you know, we rise and fall together. And, and the truth of the matter is, is all of us might rise a little bit, but we'll rise way further together. And I, I think that's really what we're, I, the vision really echoes so strongly like we could keep on our individual paths here in Maryland or in DC or in Virginia, but we could go so much further in really putting our region on the map and not just attracting uh, an Amazon and the national landing, but other big companies to this region that would benefit all of our workforce um, and really open the door to grow our economy. And in my mind, really be the economy that can compete on an international level. I think so much we narrow ourselves to thinking about inside the United States, but at the end of the day, we are in a competitive international environment and we have that capacity here um, to really lift up all in the region. Um, and I think the vision is absolutely essential um, to that. Um, 
So I, I think the potential exists there. I think the fact of all of us talking about it, the group that was put together by the Greater Washington Partnership, um, frankly, the effort that happened even just last year on the House bill and the General Assembly, and while the governor vetoed it, you know, I'm really hopeful it's going to be overrode pretty soon, um, and we can move forward with that initial investment. But what we saw on that was actually something that doesn't always happen even in Maryland is Baltimore and the DC region joining together because we realize we're interwoven. Um, we will succeed together. Um, so I, I think there's a lot more of that than there was many years ago. Um, and I think we just need to keep in mind, this is possible. Um, this, this is not um, some vision that can't be achieved. It's completely achievable and doable. Um, we just got to roll up our sleeves and prioritize it as John Picari mentioned. Yeah, definitely. So um, first question that's coming in, I'm going to kind of bottle it up uh, a few different, uh, few different questions into the two part, right? Um, we're looking at a, a glass half full uh, growing system uh, while there's a global pandemic going on and, and until recent action by Congress, uh, many of our transit agencies were uh, staring uh, at, a, at a doomsday scenario. I think, you know, there's two, two part question here. One, um, and I'm going to tee it up, and I imagine the, the quick answer is we shouldn't uh, uh, focus on uh, commuter rail where maybe ridership is down at 90% loss at, at the expense of our bus system or others. I think collectively this group all work together uh, to advocate for, for additional funding for Congress. So I think we need to make sure that, that the Metro bus system, that that the, the MTA system in, in Baltimore City, the GRTC, and, and that the commuter rail system all uh, focus. But during the COVID, we've got to go ahead and continue to advocate with one voice to Congress to continue to save the day. But I think longer term, you know, this is an effort that, that we're looking at uh, while there's a global pandemic going on. And, and I guess the question to, to the panel would be, how do we prioritize the short term versus the long term? Should we just be focusing on the here and now or can we be planning and investing in a big, bold system when, like I said, 90% of the ridership has declined? You know, Jay, you're doing good work in national landing, continuing to advance big investments there that aren't going to come online for years. How would you kind of answer that question? Well, I think you could, you know, your, your lead in uh, <laughs> gave the first part of that answer is these, as we all know, these projects are long term. You know, the, the chart you went through earlier went out to 2045. Um, it's necessary. That's how the, it's the nature of these large projects and, and changes like what we're discussing. Um, but I also, uh, and Joe, you, you know this well, I, I've been um, since the beginning um, pushing for short term actions we can take. And that's why I was so pleased. And it's been mentioned before uh, Delegate Solomon's bill in Maryland to introduce a pilot uh, service. It's not going to solve all the problems or achieve the vision that we described, but it's something that we can get a flag in the ground now for those people who are making choices about where to live, who may have been hired recently, or um, people looking for jobs and saying, can I get, can I apply to that job as a sustainable living all the way out here? So I think um, doing short-term things like that can help us make the case and ultimately uh, will better position us to implement the full vision that is described. Um, the, the pandemic is, you know, understandably a short-term, uh, the, Commuter rail is, is in a very unique position at the moment, but I think we're all operating under the assumption that trends will swing back to closer to where they were before and that a robust workable regional transit system is necessary for all the goals that we share um, economically and otherwise. Would uh, the other panelists agree with that assessment? Yeah. If I could weigh in, we need to take the long view um, and not not be dissuaded. You know, you'll have bumps along the road, so to speak. <laughs> um, and, you know, and we saw that actually with the VRE, with commuter rail. We, you know, we had bad times and good times and, um, and every once in a while people wanted to give up on the whole thing. Um, transportation is hard and getting big things done requires um, persistence and tenacity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think so too. I, and I think, you know, some of these investments, unfortunately, are going to take years. There are going to be great jobs that are created as a result that are going to help us, you know, in the president-elect's uh, terms here, build back better. 
Um, but we need to do the work today to make sure that the say tunnel is ready in 2030s uh, in Baltimore. But with it, it comes tens of thousands of good paying jobs that, that can help us recover uh, in a more strong way. There are a couple questions about shifting land use patterns as well in the chat box around um, folks shifting uh, from say a more urban setting to a more uh, suburban uh, or, or more rural setting and, and how that impacts uh, the effort that's afoot here. Um, you know, how, how do you all see kind of shifting land use patterns uh, playing out over, over the next 10 to 20 uh, years and, and, and whether or not the rail vision uh, has that opportunity to capture that, that shifting, shifting demand? So, this is, I'm yeah. happy to go first on this one. I mean, I, I think when you look at the network in Maryland in particular, we haven't spoken as much about the Brunswick line, but um, if you combine the sort of Brunswick, Camden and Penn line, I think what you see is this amazing opportunity for people to find different places to live and still be way connected to transportation and not have to take an hour long car ride. I mean, I we, we could spend a lot of time about the longer we're in the pandemic and how people's behavior is shifting, right? All of us are doing Zoom. We were not doing Zoom a year ago and yet it's like become sort of natural for us. And we have most of our workforce teleworking which we were also not doing um, a year ago. So there's a lot of things that have changed but I think of myself when I start going back to work and I don't know about the rest of you but I don't, I, yeah, do I want that peace and quiet in the morning so I can think about my day? Would I like to be able to look at my um, phone in the morning and do all of that? I would, do I want to be doing that in a car? Actually, no. Um, for parents, and I'm one with slightly older kids, but for parents, I don't think we want to be spending that much time in the car. Like we've had now the advantage of seeing our kids more than oftentimes we do because we're like shuffling them between places, um, particularly when they can be young. And, and so I, I, think, um, I think we'd actually be short-sighted if we're not starting to do the investment thinking about the commuter rail. Um, and I think actually we would propel our region backwards. Um, and that's not to say that we don't have some crises we have to deal with with Metro. You know, I have a ton of purple line stops. Trust me, I find I follow that project like um, a hawk um, and there's been some challenges, um, but we don't get to a great 10 years or five years in this region in the future, unless we're doing the beginning in investment now. Um, and, and so I, I, I just would leave us with that. Yeah, go ahead. I, I think it's important to remember that passenger rail is not like metro rail. So you don't have the same kind of headways. Um, you, you're in, in the case of Mark and BRE, you're using um, freight railroad uh, right of way and tracks. And, and those are already there and people already live in communities um, around those tracks. And so you don't have as much of an opportunity to um, make dramatic changes to uh, land use, at least I don't think that you would. Um, and and so yes, there should be maybe some changes, but I don't. But I but I think it's important that we're realistic uh, about what what passenger rail is versus metro rail, a faster, you know, greater headways that require. Um, greater densities, much greater densities. Yeah. Yeah, and we've got to be able to walk before we run. Uh, we right. have a partnership like to, to think big and bold, but you know, we've got to do the, the small things and start to build together. Um, we are uh, up at time. Uh, I'm gonna quickly hit on two items and then go ahead and, and, and close it out. But you know, there was a question about recreational benefit and amenities. I think there are a lot of um, secondary benefits outside of just somebody going from point A to point B on a, on a commuter trip or otherwise, but recreational benefits of getting to the mountains like uh, West Virginia and being able to ride your bike back uh, because you took your bike and ride it back on the CNO or, or be able to get down to Richmond, Virginia for, for a nice weekend on the 
on the Capitol Trail Network down there. There's a lot of new connections that are enabled uh, as more and more people start to explore the system, more ridership has grown, more heads and beds, more economic opportunity. I think really what a lot of this work does is put the, put the capital region at the center of the Northeast and, and the Southeast corridors and create new opportunities for people to come and explore uh, and, and to, to enjoy the, the great um, benefits and, and cultural amenities that we have here. I, uh, Chair Belova also said, and there's been questions in the, in the Q&A about our engagement um, with uh, the, the class one rail operators. We have uh, been in discussions with them and working with them and we at the partnership have regular conversations with them as do many of our, our rail operators throughout the region. They're critical, but everybody's critical, right? This doesn't happen, like I said at the beginning, by just one individual working. We've all got to believe that it's the right thing to do. We've got to create shared expectations, shared visions that are the first steps, but then we ultimately need to work together to move it forward. Um, and that takes efforts like we've said multiple times, Delegate Solomon's bill in Maryland. You know, This year, Governor Northam's putting a budget line forward to expand capacity on the Manassas line and then ultimately down to Roanoke and the like. It takes the collective, we've gotta be working together in a coordinated, cohesive way. But I think we at the Greater Washington Partnership are committed to that. Uh, we've got, we think we've got the talent. We, we know we've got the, the gumption. We've done big things before and we can do big things when we're working together. So, um, you know, with that, I'll go ahead and, and wrap things up and thanks everybody for joining us uh, for this webinar today. Um, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, please reach out with any additional questions, feedback, and the like. But I think what I will say is uh, it's not going to happen overnight, but it's not going to happen without the collective working together. Uh, we've got four great leaders here today that joined us, but there are many others. But thank you very much, uh, panel, uh, for joining uh, today and, and for your commitment and support of this effort. And thank you, everybody, for joining uh, this webinar today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.